I am myself. I could be someone else, you or you or you, and likewise you could be anybody. Our individuality is a uniquely felt thing, but few people would argue that uh, someone looking down from a flying saucer would probably see us as interchangeable, the way we see ants as interchangeable. The ants are a fractal example of an animal population because all ants appear more or less alike and all ant societies of the same species appear more or less alike. Yet from the point of view of the monad at any level in the modular hierarchy, there is a unique perspective and a unique uh, centering process which creates an individuality, a point of view, a self which is sustained in time. But then when you turn toward this temporal dimension, which the self is sustained in, you discover what I mentioned in another context yesterday, that time also has this fractal quality. One minute is rather like another. One day is rather like another. One year is rather like another. And yet, each day, each moment, each year is different. And so there is this strange tension between the self-similitude of temporal flow and also the differentiation in it. But what emerges slowly out of this is the perception that all of these flows, all of these fractals, all of these self-similar processes are embedded in similar, naturally, fractal processes at higher and higher levels of expression in space and in time so that the universe in its entirety from Big Bang to heat death or recollapse into another uh, super black hole state is a kind of tone or a kind of waveform which is then reiterated on many levels of duration which are successively smaller and smaller and fall away from the pattern of the primary waveform. And so when you look at the history of the universe on a vast scale, what you see is an initial state of great uh, indeterminacy, an inchoate state of such high energy that everything is just flying to pieces. There is no bonding energy that can overcome the kinetic energy of the system. Then as time passes and, and temperatures fall, eventually nuclear chemistry is possible. Electrons settle down into orbits around, around the nucleus of, the nuclei of atoms. Then at st a still much later point in time, the bonds, the temperature in the universe in certain areas has fallen to, and the stars have cooked out a more complex species of molecules, carbon, and suddenly very complex structures can arise. And, and this tendency toward complexification, which is, describes the history of the entire universe, also describes the history of the 20th century, your life, uh, the past six months. All of these processes have this tendency to go toward an end point of extreme complexity. And this has not, it's obvious, and it's uh, part of our literature and our art. This is why the apocalyptic and millenarian tendency is built into the Western religious tradition. This is, I believe, the yearning which Western religion satisfies in people that is not satisfied by science. In other words, that Western religion sanctifies death as some kind of culmination and conclusion, but the larger implication of that, which it explicitly makes, is that the whole history 
of, the, of humanity is moving toward an end point, an apocalypse, a momentous event which will cast everything which preceded it in some kind of new light and make everything new and morally uh, exonerate the horror that was necessary to reach that moment. In other words, to make the earth pure and clean and, uh, and new. And science is not into this. Science's uh, technology may be uh, like a disloyal child of science, which could be captured by the millenarian dream. But science itself takes the view of time so far that it is a plastic medium, but not, not highly variable on the local scale that we inhabit, and therefore essentially trivial. But this, uh, this revolution in thinking that begins with Jung's uh, clarification of the notion of synchronicity and then comes up through all the delvings into the irrational in the 20th century, and, and certainly Jung and Freud's exploration of the unconscious, exonerates a different notion of time, or at least the validity of entertaining different notions of time. Uh, technology arising out of the, the application of science to the conquest of nature, nevertheless is susceptible to millenarian expectations. The French sociologist uh, Jacques Ellul was a uh, radical technological sociologist, and he had a famous aphorism, which was, there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And this, uh, this is certainly a radical expression of it, but it may, uh, it may well be true. I believe the technological society. The technological society. It's still in print and paperback. And propaganda is another good one. Uh, technology in the form of cybernetics is becoming the, cut, the, the uh, coral reef or the technological excretion that is the truly hardwired portion of the unconscious now. And I see this as uh, the feminine, the goddess, re-emerging into three-dimensional space in the form of this, uh, what Teilhard de Chardin called the new sphere but which is more correctly identified as Sophia, the, the emanation of wisdom as a feminine spirit, as Purusha, as electricity, which completely girdles the planet and transforms it into the alchemical stone, the entity. It is the planet which is the thing that is being worked on. This is why alchemy and history can be seen to be the same thing. This is why this conference is called Shamanism, Alchemy, and the Millennium, because it's my conviction that the historical process mirroring intuitively these larger cosmic processes and smaller cosmic processes of complexification is an actual intentionalization of the creation of this overmind, or not so much its creation, but its invocation into matter to save us is essentially why this is happening. In other words, it's a Gnostic myth of the descent of the overmind into matter to recover what was lost into matter which is uh, the spark of being the oversoul in ourselves, to return to the imagination without having to pass through the narrow gate of death. And shamanism is, is related to the millennium because the shaman exemplifies the millennium before history. Iliad makes this clear, that before history, in ilio tempore, Everything was perfect, and people flew and talked to the animals, and uh, there was abundant food and no disease. The shaman is the only person who has retained this superhuman quality that existed before the fall into profane time. And the shaman, in all of 
his, her many adumbrations as alchemist, as scientist, as magician, as poet, has been the, the catalytic enzymatic personality which has sculpted the historical process and, uh, and led it forward. And it has been mediated by the, uh, the relationships to plants which mediate a relationship to an undefinable intelligent force that you can call God or the genus loci or the extraterrestrials. The fact of the matter is that the depth and nature of it can apparently not be known, that it is controlling what is revealed about itself, and that people throughout history have discovered this. It is, in fact, what religion is in the absence of institutions. And in the presence of institutions, religion isn't. This is why Taoism is so attractive because it understood and retained the idea that you could be in history and you could still know about the Tao and be in the Tao, which is really to be outside of history. And I think that there may be many ways to do it. What, what gatherings like this seem to indicate is that discursive thought is being given another chance from having been abandoned for a decade or so. So that this kind of noetic archaeology can be used to try and map out the human condition. The f emergence of the feminine in this cybernetic matrix, and Ralph made this point yesterday, is paralleled by these breakthroughs in mathematics Really, cybernetics is simply a branch of applied mathematics at this point and will become more so in the future. Space is the void into which this Gaia matrix, this maternal mama matrix, is going to expel the human intellect. It is a birth process. It is traumatic for the planet and for the people undergoing it. But it is natural, and it is necessary, and it is uh, important, I think, to have faith that it's going smoothly. We can now see the future in a way that even 15 years ago people couldn't see. I mean, if we keep our ducks in a row, the next hundred, 200 years can be seen fairly clearly. All that we have to argue about is how fast you run the movie. In other words, will it be star flight by 2010 or will it take till 2050? Will, the, will we have complete ability to transfer and integrate human consciousness into machines in shared states of group telepathy by the year 2000 or 2025? What is happening is that political, it, it's almost as though, it's almost parallel to the situation in Europe when the wars of religion finally drag themselves out and where people just finally, the way the late medieval stasis was broken up was people just got sick of it. They didn't have any great moral w awakening, you know. They just said, we don't care anymore whether you're a Huguenot or a Catholic or a Cal, you know. We've just had it enough already. And I think that uh, this kind of impatience is in, is in certain places already and will grow, that capitalism is very impatient with the stodginess of uh, mass media manipulated so-called democratic societies and capitalism wants to forge ahead who knows how humanely but they they do see the potential in the future and many western institutions see only the potential for despair in the future to my mind, the future is endlessly bright and uh, the things that are going to be done are truly astonishing, but today imaginable. And uh, it is only persistence that will bring them 
to be. That's why it's very important to preserve through any dark age, whether it lasts months or years, uh, the psychedelic notion, a core of people who understand the uh, amazing creativity that is resident in the human mind, because space is the human imagination calling us forward. Those structures can be built there. These paradises can be erected. There can be a millennium. There is no question about it. Uh, any of you are, who are fans of science fiction know that science fiction is just a plethora of worlds and cultures and aliens and bizarre political situations. Well, it takes uh, six light hours for a radio signal to go from the inner planets to, say, Pluto. And that means that within 12 light hours of the sun, these O'Neill-type habitats, which everybody agrees are technically feasible, could be erected. And that means a fantastic proliferation of experimentation in human social forms. I mean, it's possible to envision the solar system as a kind of human swarm world with thousands of these colony worlds, each pursuing the social dynamics that they had evolved or were interested in exploring, all suspended in a sphere of electronic communication and data transfer such that they are living in the same day, the same solar system day, because it only takes 12 light hours for light to cross the solar system from one edge to the other. And this is a conservative future, a future which does not uh, rely on any new technical breakthroughs or discoveries of great new natural principles, of which you may be sure there will be such discoveries. So if we can lift the, uh, the lethal beast off our backs, we can go forward into a future that is endlessly bright and we've heard all kinds of solutions suggested from relaxing to dissolving it with analysis and discovering that everything is all right the way it is and everything is working out the way it is. I, I lean to believing that 80% of the time and worrying a great deal the other 20% of the time as a way to hang on. Anyway, I think I, I wanted to take this time this morning to say these things because I think they make, it makes more immediate what to some people may have seemed very arcane yesterday, which was all the mathematical stuff. Uh, someone said to me yesterday, if there's a narc listening in, what do you think he thought of the day-long uh, exploration of higher mathematics? <laughs> so, are there questions about this or anything or anything that anyone wants to say? Could you elaborate a bit on the concept of cybernetics? Cybernetics. Yes, well, I said earlier that I, I thought a network like Myconet is essentially, uh, Myconet is this computer network on the source that we have organized uh, for people with interests in this area, where you can log in and then, using a pseudonym, uh, interact in any way you want. In other words, it's a new kind of public or quasi-public space where once you have entered into the network, you are totally anonymous, which is to means totally free. There's a Japanese saying, the tourist need have no shame. Well, this, <laughs> this is, no, it's absolutely true. <laughs> so the tourist on the computer network need have no shame be, you can say anything, no one can find out who said it, and so you can speak your mind and communicate <laughs> freely. That small beginning 
typing away at the keyboard and sending e-letters to various mailboxes and interacting in this funny way which is faster than the mail but slower than the telephone is the beginning of a neural network which in a few years, four years, five years, will have the ability to process uh, visual data and much more high resolution forms of data. Even at the present level, you are able to upload papers and people can download them and read them. You can upload programs which people can run but not download but comment on or download and comment on. In other words, it creates an, a kind of instantaneous linking together of people which, you know, I hate the mechanics of the computer. I mean, I just think it's completely obnoxious. But it's like, it's like learning to drive, but it's tougher than that. It's like learning to drive a sports car. But once you learn to drive it, then you can, you know, there are these thrills. And I think that if people will cooperate and actually use the network and force themselves in a way to use it, in other words, don't call somebody, use the email, just make it uh, part of your life, then the kind of community that we produce when we're here at Esalen uh, can be carried over not at such an intense level, but we won't each fall then back into our, uh, our own groove. This then is going to be repeated on a massive scale and is being repeated. Nine million computers a month are being hooked into communication systems. And most of these are for the networking purposes of small management groups. This is the new organism which is taking shape that is the organism which survives our, our electronically linked groups of like-minded people who have clearly defined their goals and are working together to achieve them. Uh, by being able to search and find people and then stay in touch with them, we become much more powerful on the socio-political dimension where this kind of progress yeah. is made. Okay, so that's one aspect about cybernetics. The, the more generalized aspect for society is that uh, mind-machine interaction is going to become a major frontier for development and redefinition. And, and when that happens, the accretions of technology, the keyboard, the video display, all of this will begin to disappear. And it's not unreasonable to expect that eventually you will just access by thought almost. In other words, I take the hallucinogens as the model for the ideal computing system. The hallucinogens when they're working perfectly. You know, when you can say at, in a psilocybin state, Art Deco, and minions of Art Deco objects begin drifting slowly through your field of vision, tumbling slowly, each one, you know, the most perfect delineation of the Art Deco aesthetic that you've ever seen. And then you say, uh, you know, Hieronymus Bosch, and you're there. This kind of interaction with an invisible dimension of vast intelligence is coming to be. Now, I think that it's always existed in, f in a wetware form. This is what shamanism is. This is what all societies end up building, whether they build it out of mushrooms, morning glories, and tobacco smoke, or silicon, copper, gold, and plastic, you know. Everybody ends up erecting a cybernetic global network of information for transferring the information that they have culturally validated and seek to preserve. And we look at the people in the Amazon and say, you know, how quaint, how primitive, so forth. We haven't the faintest notion of what's actually going on how they know what they know, how they do what they do. When we were at La Chirera, it was uncanny how much the Witoto knew 
about things a hundred, a hundred and twenty-five miles away. I mean, we would visit the priest and be standing there when over the radio you would hear that an airplane had landed at mission so-and-so, but then you would walk back to your camp and meet someone and they would say, I was just talking to this Indian and he said those people that were expected at so-and-so came today. You know, well, what is going on there? Each technology appears to the savants of another technology as magic to the shaman who were doing that trick in the Amazon. But nevertheless, the erection of this network is very important, and I see it as a feminizing thing. People have a lot of trouble with that because they tend to think of computers as machines. Computers are machines now, but computers don't need to be machines. Computers are arrangements of arrays and elements that can uh, uh, exist uh, in any medium. And uh, we are simply passing through a phase where they are machines. Very soon they will probably be created by DNA and be rather like bone tissue or something like that. Uh, once the biological and the cybernetic come together, why the division between machines and uh, life will be seen to be like the difference between a snail and its shell. I mean, the shell is not much like the snail, but to say that one is alive and one isn't is a little, you know, begging the question. And also, the cybernetic uh, revolution is going to allow the modeling through things like what Ralph is doing, and Ralph didn't even talk yesterday about his Hollywood project, uh, is going to allow the modeling of psychedelic states and even theoretical psychedelic states. In other words, configurations of consciousness which no drug, synthetic or natural, uh, can cause to happen can be elicited by creating hypothetical brain state situations. Modeling of the brain is going to create a complete understanding of the fine-grained nature of consciousness. It will not answer questions about the soul and free will and being, but it will answer what are all these things made of, you know, and how do they work at the, at the uh, uh, formal uh, cellular level. So cybernetics, uh, I think, came along just in time. It is the knitting together. It's, it's an exocompound. You don't put it into your body, you uh, interact with it at the keyboard. But you know, the keyboard is entirely an illusion of this very early mechanical stage that we're in of interacting with the machine. I mean, think how it would be if the keyboard were not there and nothing were there and just to use a computer would be to sit down and to just compose yourself in a certain state of mind and then you would be in the network and able to word search the Library of Congress and all of these things. Uh, this is obviously the coming. I mean, this is what technology seeks to do and we need unobtrusive technologies if we're to survive because the kind of chaotic, propagandized, mass-minded, atomized, uh, competitive, egocentric, patriarchal tendencies that are in all of us uh, at present are lethal. And you know, they're more present in the leadership than anywhere else. So. Uh, the situation is, uh, is critical and uh, exotic solutions must be the only ones that one can put one's faith in because the logic, logic has outrun itself. The whole mess is a creation of the, uh, of the logical mind. I mean, it seemed so clear back there in the 17th century, you know, the universal rights of man and so forth but uh, it turned out rather badly, and it's because it was a, a masculine, uh, one-sided uh, 
undertaking as Western civilization had been since the suppression of the goddess and the breakup of Eleusis and the going underground of uh, ecstatic states where you get in touch with the overmind and get the historical juice, the direction for the historical process. Now this is coming again, but let's hope not too late. I don't think so. I think that it's just uh, going to be a hair-raising, hell-raising experience, but that we will be reborn and that it will come to pass that uh, the human future is secured, perhaps for tens of thousands of years in our lifetime. It has to do with diffusing the political situation, dispersing people through the solar system, and unleashing capitalism in a humane environment, which means a uninhabited environment of unlimited resources, which means nowhere on Earth. It can't be on Earth. If I had the power to do it, I would turn the Earth into botanical dimensions, meaning the Earth should be a botanical garden, a repository of life forms, a carefully tended and cultivated treasure, the greatest treasure which being ever gave to the human race. And no matter how far we go and how many planets fall under our sway, it will be the gene swarm of the home planet that will eventually determine how well we do out in the galaxy. And so, you know, as I said, it is the alchemical pearl, it is the concrescence, and saving the planet, saving ourselves, saving the destiny of generations of people yet unborn is all tied up in this, com this climactic moment of historical complexity when we not only leave the planet, but leave the primate form that we have been locked in for a million years, leave our historical foolishness behind. It is uh, time for the human race to grow up and to the end of childhood and the beginning of a broader horizon of being that we intuit in the imagination, in our poetry, in our art, in our religion. But these are merely glimpses over the landscape. And now we have crossed that desert of history and we are on the brink of these things. There is an opportunity for the millennium. The problem is uh, within the human heart and the answer is uh, all around us in various ways. The question and the task is to realize it and then realize it again and then again and alchemically condense it so that finally uh, it all becomes uh, this one thing, this alchemical quintessence which makes everything new and uh, transforms and makes us safe and ends strife and ends difficulty and rescues somehow all the things that went on in the past so that they have meaning and it's all then is understood as having been toward this end, which is now achieved so that we can now rest in the peace which passeth understanding. <laughs>